Hello and welcome to the CNBC Africa special. I'm Chris Bishop. Now, the theme for today's special is Africa's unified and coordinated response to COVID-19, a public-private sector partnership. Now, with me now is one of the big names in African finance and economics, who now has a key job in helping this continent survive the COVID-19 pandemic. Her name is Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, the former finance minister of Nigeria, who's been appointed by the African Union this year as a special envoy. Now, her job is to gather international support for Africa's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. She joins me now on the line from uh, Washington, D.C. And just to start off with, uh, before we get into the business of COVID-19, you're in the throes of another, uh, dare we say, catastrophe at the moment, uh, national protests and a lot of uh, bloodletting in America about the, uh, the Floyd case. Uh, just, just, just give us an idea of exactly how that story is unfolding before your very eyes. Well, thank you. I, I mean, it's a very interesting time. Um, the people, especially young people of all races and colors, are very exercised about what happened to Mr. George uh, Floyd. And um, it, it's a very moving sign to see all these people marching and everybody recognizing that what happened to him is not right. And it's time for us to treat everybody uh, fairly, regardless of the color of their skin. So I think it's a momentous time. If you look at the composition of those marching, it's people of all colors, black, white, uh, uh, Hispanic, everyone is there. And uh, yes, do you, and just do you, do you see this particular story? How do you see it developing over the next few weeks or so? Well, one doesn't know really uh, which way and direction it's going. But I think that uh, from everything one can gather, uh, people are demonstrating very peacefully. It's lasted uh, so many days now, m more than a week. And it appears that uh, they're prepared to keep going, perhaps until they are sure that there'll be justice uh, for Mr. Floyd. Now, we just go back to your, uh, your new job as an envoy for the African Union. It says that you have to gather international support for the fight uh, against COVID-19 here in Africa. Just exactly how are you approaching this job and, and what do you have to achieve with it? I think this job just shows how uh, the AU has approached the whole COVID-19 effort as in a unified manner, recognizing that acting in concert as one. This is why the AU appointed five envoys to help mobilize financial resources uh, for the, to, to help Africa fight the pandemic. You've got well-known uh, African personalities, former finance ministers, uh, Mr. Trevor Manuel of South Africa, Dr. Don Kabaruka of Rwanda, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdurrahman uh, Benkalfa of Al Algeria, Mr. Tijan Tian, former CEO of Credit Suisse of Côte d'Ivoire. So the five of us are working uh, very hard at it. And there's also a special envoy to help with the procuring of uh, medical supplies and equipment and logistics, Mr. Strive Masiwa, so that the continent approaches uh, everything as a whole. We are not bidding against each other as we are looking for equipment, face masks, PPE, and all the other supplies, but we can go as a whole and that can get us better prices. And then we get the financing support to, to, to help procure this. Let me just say one thing before talking about our effort to mobilize resources outside. It, it, I'm very proud to say that the continent itself has worked very hard to, to, to uh, mobilize its own resources for this fight. Each country has put in place fiscal measures in order to help uh, mitigate the pandemic, both from the health side and the economic side. Um, you know, postponed taxes, lifted tariffs, uh, they've uh, Im implemented a fiscal stimulus in many countries. So a lot has been done. The African Union has uh, put together a fund or is trying to put together a fund of $350 million to help the African CDC and help with the fight on the continent. And African countries and philanthropists have already themselves contributed more than $60 million of this. So before you go out to help, to seek help, you've already helped yourself. That's a bit the rationale. 
Now, on the international scene, um, the World Health Organization has said that this is, you know, shouldn't be seen as an African problem, it should be seen as a world problem. But what's the sort of reception you're getting when you're going around with the other envoys asking for international support and help? I think we've gotten very good receptivity so far, and it's really gratifying. Uh, the multilateral institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, uh, have been uh, supportive and uh, have already tried to mobilize uh, their own resources to, to help uh, the continent. And of course, we are pushing them to do more because finance ministers on the continent have estimated we need about 100 billion, uh, which will be 5% of uh, uh, roughly 5% of GDP to be able to come to terms with the economic and health impact of the pandemic. So they've been friendly, the multilateral organizations, the African Development Bank has put together a $10 billion fund. The, the IMF has disbursed about 13 billion. The World Bank has committed about 14 billion. So all this is happening. And uh, other multilaterals like Islamic Bank are also being supportive. Afrex Bank, uh, which is on the continent, has put together about $3 billion for the private sector to be able to help uh, weather the crisis and, and continue to work their work on the continent. We are also approaching the multilaterals and sorry, the bilaterals, the, the government partners to see what else they too can do. And of course, you know, we are pushing for a, a two year debt standstill. The G20 has been forthcoming and has opened the door to a standstill to the end of this year. But we feel this is not enough that we need two years for African countries to, to get breathing space so they can use those resources to fight the COVID battle. How uh, likely is it that this debt standstill, I mean, President Cyril Ramaphosa has been calling for it here. How likely do you think that the, uh, the world is going to uh, uh, assist Africa with this debt standstill? I'm very hopeful. I'm, I'm really hopeful because, as I said, the G20 has already acknowledged that this is something worthwhile and they've opened the door and agreed to a standstill till the end of 2020. But we feel that this uh, pandemic, the impacts might last uh, quite a bit longer than most people think. It will not end at the end of this year. It could go through 2021 to 2022 before we begin to recover. Therefore, that's why we are asking them for two years and um, I'm hopeful, I think we will be able to, to make it through. And um, also, how much is at stake here? I mean, you as a former finance minister can tell us um, that the impact that this COVID-19 is likely to have on uh, the economy of Africa is going to be devastating. Um, do you, have you uh, read it, see any work on it? I mean, how much it could be costing us? Well, let's put it this way. First of all, we, ha we have to... to, to think of uh, how hard the pandemic has hit and the fact that if we don't take, take action uh, we might have be set back even uh, a decade or two remember that the continent even though it had its problems was doing relatively well on the growth path um, but now this pandemic has come and it might lead to in fact the imf estimates that uh, for the first time in 25 years africa might experience an a contraction of the economy to the of two about two percent and it's likely that when they revise their figures in june it might be even worse so this is something we've not seen for 25 years and that is why it's extremely important that we take all measures to try and re-stimulate the economy just as the rich countries are doing uh, re-stimulate economies uh, on the continent so that we can begin to bounce back and um, what else do you think that's going to take, you think? Because um, private business obviously is trying to come to the party as well. You mentioned some of the banks. What else do you think needs to be done in terms of business fighting this pandemic? Well, there's a, a, the, the, a very critical thing is to make sure that our businesses also receive support, have we seen, as we have seen in other countries. They need a lifeline. We have a lot of small and medium enterprises, many of them run by women. Uh, who, who work daily to support their households. So it will be critically important to make sure that uh, there are lines of credit, liquidity that is provided to these uh, 
these uh, businesses so that uh, they don't go insolvent. And we are also working on that. We are trying to urge uh, the International Monetar Monetary Fund uh, to work with us and with uh, several of our developed country partners to see if we can uh, get additional liquidity for our countries through the special drawing rights, pooling of special drawing rights, which are a form of currency that the I IMF can, can convert into actual money, into actual dollars, and also um, give lenders liquidity to our central banks so that they can unlend this uh, to the economy, to businesses. So we have big businesses on the continent, like the airlines. You know, we have Ethiopian, Rwandan Air, uh, Kenyan, so many airlines that are also suffering, just like airlines in, in other countries. They need support. You know, the airline industry employs, employs directly and indirectly about 6.2 million people on the continent and uh, contributes about $58 billion uh, to our GDP. So th that would be a very critical thing, especially for particular countries like Ethiopia, if they don't get support. So in addition to the small businesses, we need lines of credit to support some of our big businesses as well and to preserve jobs. What are the chances of uh, a vaccine coming along? I know there's hundreds of laboratories all over the world working on one at the moment. What, what do you think the chances are? Well, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist, but um, definitely, uh, you, as you know, I'm WHO envoy for the ACT Accelerator, which is an initi international initiative to try and accelerate the speed with which we get vaccines and then make sure that they are distributed equitably. And um, within this uh, uh, initiative is uh, Gavi, the organization which I chair the board, uh, the Global Vaccine Alliance, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. And they are looking at about eight to 10 vaccines that might be, uh, uh, that some of which are on trial now, uh, and, and might be available, but nobody thinks they'll be ready before, say, end, beginning of next year to mid next year. Um, but there's a possibility that we'll have a, a vaccine that will be effective and, and high quality uh, and, and then affordable. So what we are doing in Gavi, we had a, a replenishment yesterday, and I'm very happy to tell you that the international community, everybody was there. We, we were targeting to raise $7.4 billion, and we actually raised $8.8 billion, part of which will go to a mechanism called the Advanced Market Commitment, which we use to incentivize the production of vaccines for poorer countries when they become available. So I, I'm very, very happy and proud that we started on this road to make sure that when vaccines are available, uh, not only the rich countries get them, but the poorer countries in the world also get access. And just, uh, I know you talked a little bit earlier about uh, the international debt relief. Uh, I want to talk specifically about China. It's one of Africa's biggest uh, bilateral creditors. It's got loans, something like $146 billion in the continent. What's been the attitude from China that you're getting uh, in terms of helping out when the continent needs it? Well, we're, we're talking to China, and um, you're right, uh, it's uh, the biggest bilateral creditor we have, and debt service is in the range of about $8 billion uh, a year. Um, and China has joined with the G20 to open the door to the standstill. So they are part of the G20, so we're quite happy with that. But we're working very, ha trying to work hard with them to see if they will also uh, perhaps take a bit of a lead to agree to the two-year standstill. And we're very hopeful that they will. We're in dialogue with them at the moment. The AU has reached out, and we envoys uh, are following uh, those steps to see uh, what agreement we can get. Another issue in all of this is climate change. I mean, one of the unintended consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic is a lot less traveling going along, a lot fewer people moving around. And I could tell you in Johannesburg, the skies are clearer than they've been for decades because of this COVID-19 pandemic. Do you think this is a window of opportunity to try to do something more about climate change as a continent? Absolutely. Uh, you've, just, uh, uh, you've just 
pointed to a very important point. Actually, I've seen numbers that, in, you know, carbon emissions may have gone down by 17%. Several of our cities, uh, people can now see blue skies that they didn't see uh, for, for some time. So I think we should see some opportunity in this crisis. And what do I mean by that? Uh, Churchill said, never waste a crisis. Mm -hmm. So we can look at this and say, how do we build back better? That's what everybody is talking about. So that when we spend stimulus money, we don't spend it in the same old way, doing things the same old way we did before. We can now build back infrastructure or add new infrastructure in a climate friendly way. And I believe Africa cannot really be a leader in this. Uh, as you know, two thirds of our infrastructure is yet to be built. So we have a great opportunity to lead the world in greener infrastructure, more sustainable. We can move more and more towards renewables. Um, uh, uh, and this will be very low carbon emissions uh, pathway that we would be following as we build our infrastructure. We can phase out fuel subsidies uh, for, for in, on, in many countries. And in fact, many of our countries like my own Nigeria have begun to phase this out with the low price of oil. That will also help towards the carbon emissions. We can build smarter or re refurbish our cities in a smarter, greener way. And we can look towards greener industrialization. So Africa really has this opportunity because it's still building so many things to be a leader in this field. And this is what we mean by build back better. As we also build back better, let's not forget the role of women. We must hear women, women's voices and the voices of youth. They are the ones who need the jobs. And uh, there have been many studies that show that going greener can also create many new jobs for our youth. So for all these reasons, I think we really have an opportunity that we should not miss. And uh, also, um, aside from the financial and the, the climate change damage on the continent, I mean, what about the, uh, the psyche amongst the people of Africa? I mean, it's going to change everything that we do in the future. Yes, I think this pandemic um, maybe has accelerated some trends that were there before, but has also had its own impact. I have to say that on the continent, we had a bit of an advantage because, you know, we're used to dealing with infectious diseases. We've dealt with Ebola, HIV, AIDS, uh, uh, you know, we have polio, we have, uh, we have other diseases, polio, malaria. So both infectious and, and, and non-infectious diseases, we're used to dealing with this. And for the infectious diseases, we've had systems put in place so even though our health systems are not that strong, we've developed some knowledge on how to manage uh, 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 these diseases. So um, that has uh, stood us in, in somewhat of a, a good stead. Um, but of course, uh, we would not wish this pandemic to, to come because uh, the psyche, uh, you know, that people have talked of mental stress during lockdowns. There have been unpleasant things like increase in gender violence. A study talks about 20% increase all over the world. We don't have the numbers in Africa. So there are some mental uh, stress issues linked to that, which would make us think of how do we live our lives and how do we live differently? One thing I also want to mention on the economic side that we, makes us, should make us think differently on the continent is look how vulnerable we have been to a fall in the prices of our commodities. We still export mainly commodities uh, to China, to Europe, and other places. And when these places had a lockdown, then the prices of our products fell precipitously. Oil prices fell by 60% between December uh, of last year and March of this year. Prices of metals fell by 11%. So we really need to kind of step back and rethink how we do how we reorganize our economies differently for a smarter more manufacturing on the continent you you see supply chains that have been very difficult for medical supplies and we import 94 percent of our pharmaceuticals on the continent so we need to rethink how do we manufacture more of what we need 
both in medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, but also other areas. How do we trade more with ourselves? We've got the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, so that opens a window of opportunity. So I think the future can be quite bright if we do things and reorganize our economies differently. And uh, in these uh, difficult times as well, a lot of people looking for leadership. Uh, what, uh, what can you give uh, to us in terms of hope? Oh, um, um, I know this, these are really uh, difficult times, and, um, but there's a lot to be hopeful about in the sense that what I was saying before is that let's not just look at the downside of what has happened. But also, let us look at the opportunities that will emerge. Let's think about education. You know, our children have had to stay out of school during the lockdown. But those who have access to the internet have been able to pursue online education. So as we build back, let's think technology. Let's think of how we can lay the fiber optic cables or put the satellites that can link even our rural areas, connect them to the rest of the world. Almost everybody has some kind of mobile phone now. How do we get uh, uh, inexpensive technology and laptops and so into the hands of our children so that they can learn, even, when, even if they are not directly uh, going to a classroom? You know, these are some of the new things that should give us hope particularly our girls, if we can get online education, some of them who can't go to school can learn from home. So uh, we can choose to look at these things as difficulties, or we can choose to see a silver lining, uh, opportunities that we can take up. And I think for me, there's hope. There's hope in our building back better and greener. There's hope in our creating more jobs for our youth if we do build back smartly. There's hope in changing the way we do education. There's hope in putting women at the center. There's hope in help, helping our small businesses uh, and helping even our bigger ones uh, to survive the pandemic and, 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 and grow for the future. And just looking to the future now in your, your job as an envoy for the African Union, maybe you can tell us the, the, the money, the, the billions of dollars that are being gathered to fight COVID-19 what is the mechanism to uh, distribute them? Well, if you, if you look at the way it's being done for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, they deal with the countries directly. So uh, these monies we are talking about are discussed with each individual country and, and directly dispersed to them. And, uh, so, and one of the things that we are quite keen on is to make sure that the use of these resources are very transparent country after country, because on our African continent, one of the biggest pieces of feedback we have is, well, if you're going to go out and mobilize additional resources, make sure that these are used for the pandemic, for the good of the country, and that we have a transparent accounting. So we are also talking to civil society on the continent. You know, we are meeting with various heads of state on this issue of accountability and transparency. It's important, not just for the resources, that come from outside, but also our own domestic resources. And as you know, many of our governments already have systems in place, you know, to publish their budgets and show what revenues they have. But we need to keep doing that and make sure that our populations see that any monies brought in for the pandemic are being used in a very effective way. So how will people on the ground in Africa start noticing this uh, particular drive to pour money into the fight against COVID-19? I think the first thing is to tell you that um, uh, one of the special envoys, Mr. Strive Masiwa, who is in charge of lo logistics and uh, medical supplies and equipment, has built a platform for all African countries. Uh, and with the monies that have been disbursed already, they'll be able to go on this platform and purchase all the, the equipment, the face masks. First, purchasing from those producing on the continent. We want to give them the first uh, boost and, and support. And then in any other things from any suppliers outside. So people, citizens, should be able to see that the medical centers uh, that are, are treating COVID-19 patients have the supplies and equipment they need, that the medical are frontline workers who are so brave in, in looking after us 
have the protective gear that they need, that our hospitals have the adequate space. So that is one very prominent thing that they can see. I hope they can also see that in some of our urban areas and rural, that the government has also used some of the money to provide uh, water. Because in some places we talk of hand washing, but people don't even have clean water. So providing clean water using some of that money. Thirdly, social safety nets. For those who cannot work and have been stuck at home because of the lockdowns, we need to strengthen the social safety net, make sure that food is distributed and money is distributed to households. And I know some countries have been doing this. They've been actually using mobile payment systems to distribute money directly to households and individuals. And some have been uh, also distributing food supplies. So we want to see that in a very concrete way. Fourthly, for agriculture, planting season is coming in in many parts of Africa. We also have parts that have drought and others that are battling the low cost. Uh, I, we hope that some of these monies will be put towards assisting our rural people with the appropriate seeds and fertilizer and whatever is needed to fight low costs and help with the drought so that they can uh, make sure they plant enough for their families and even uh, to sell outside within the country. So these are some of the concrete ways. Lastly, I talked about building back infrastructure. I hope some of the monies will be used for greener infrastructure, be it uh, uh, providing more energy systems, electricity, renewable solar systems, and so on, or repairing our roads and our ports. Uh, and I hope these are visible things people can see. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us there live from uh, Washington, D.C. That was Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, the former finance minister of Nigeria, who is the current African Union special envoy. Her job is to gather international support for Africa's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on this CNBC Africa special. From me, Chris Bishop, it's goodbye. <laughs>